and uh, we found that in this informal settlement there are emerging public authorities, non-statutory institutions that are forming organisations and they're providing a range of public services, security, safety, they're regulating uh, buildings, they're taxing the population, they're administering justice and policing. Okay? Um, so related to how this uh, organisation is forming, uh, and doing the things that government is supposed to do, but isn't doing because they're not really there, is like how this organisation is forming quite a unique social contract with, uh, with the residents in this place. Uh, so, it's a, so it's a case of, uh, of an organisation forming from below, and it's, uh, and it's doing the things that in any other place in Africa, perhaps a local district assembly uh, would, would do. Okay? Um, the main, like, uh, the main crunch of it is that uh, a, a lot of the literature we read about the formation of public authorities, they will tell us, especially in political science literature, it will tell us that public authorities they emanate from formal state law. Okay, this is an example where public authority doesn't emanate from formal state law or the things coming out from central government. It comes for uh, uh, public authorities they're formed as a result of negotiations and claims and counterclaims you know, between a, a whole range of institutions. So that's basically, if I get struck by lightning, like Morton, this is the message I want you to read for today. Um, so in, 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 a, in a broader perspective, it's about um, how people manage and don't manage to solve a whole range of very nasty, complex developmental challenges in, in, the, in, in, a, in an area that is faced with enormous challenges. Okay? So what I want to do today is basically threefold, uh, introduce the case, give you, try and give you an idea about what is happening in this, in this area, um, exemplify some of the tasks that this de facto local government institution is doing, and then uh, the third point, kind of like try and zoom out and cover some theoretical and uh, conceptual issues. Uh, slide, slide please. I don't know how much of that you can see. Um, this is the site. Um, my, you know, my, my, my time at this conference and other conferences, it tells me that every, you know, every developing country has one of these, right? And every developing city in sub-Saharan Africa has got at least one of these. Uh, this is a cross. It's called uh, Old Fadama, and it's the, it's the largest informal settlement in Accra. Um, by sub-Saharan African standards, it's relatively modest. There was a census carried out in 2006 that numbered the population at 78,000. Now we're nearly 10 years after that, uh, it's probably around 100,000. Um, bro uh, more broadly in Accra, there, the government has registered 78 informal settlements of, of uh, varying sizes and densities and qualities. This is, this is the largest one. And, and uh, using a handful of indicators, it's also one of the worst. Um, the population is mainly uh, domestic. Uh, over 90% of the population are migrants from the northern regions of Ghana. So very little, maybe only about 1 or 2% transnational migrants. Uh, and again, like the, national, the, the national drivers of areas like this developing is like there's no rural employment opportunities, uh, accommodation costs anywhere else in the city. Uh, the general law of the city that has been going on since climate, so it's what we know economic contraction, and uh, of course, like so many other stories we've heard this week, like no viable urban planning. Uh, last but not least, there's an investment preference for high-end housing, okay? So, I mean, every, basically every sub-Saharan after city has got areas like this developing. Um, this one is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, this one is squeezed on three sides. There's a, there's a waterway here, and there's a lagoon here, and on the north side, it's squeezed by a trunk road. So it's kind of like there's no like, natural room for it to develop. Um, it's got enormous um, uh, infrastructure problems. It is famous, there's a neighboring site called Ekaboshi, which some of you might have heard of. It's famous as, the, as a site of uh, e-waste dumping from Europe and America. Uh, I was quite proud uh, in 2013 when I was there. I think we're actually celebrating it. There was a report on it by the BBC. Uh, the Blacksmith Institute actually named it the most polluted place on the planet. And uh, people took pride of that. And there were 
I mean, my plan isn't that we live in the most polluted place on the planet. It's, it's a source of like, local, local pride. Uh, simply because the levels of cyanide and like all the nasty things that come out when you take car batteries apart and all this kind of stuff, it seeps into the soil. Uh, it's, it's, it's not very nice at all. Uh, apart from that, it's, um, it's prone to flooding. Uh, the, uh, the estuary to the uh, Gulf of Guinea is down here. And of course, all the, uh, all the um, uh, household waste, you name it, it all goes into the lagoon. The lagoon the the uh, the, the clogs up, and of course, the, uh, and it leads to all sorts of uh, flooding problems uh, further up in this side of this world. Uh, about 40 years ago, most of this was like mangrove swamp. So naturally, it's, it's like, it's barely uh, half a metre of our sea level. Um, it's also prone to fires, okay, because, simply because of the density of the housing and the other the way, of course. So, like, again, like, in a, on a border level, it's a, it's a hot, hot potato for any political party or government. Very tricky balance. On the one hand, the, uh, the government has to provide a level of services to the very poor, who live in places like this. But on the other hand, by providing services, uh, they can't discourage settlement of people moving to these places. And the third kind of like hot potato issue is that they want to follow the rule of law and they want to punish squatters. Okay? In 2002, there was an eviction notice served by the High Court of Ghana, so it is, it, it, it is really illegal. The, the, the eviction notice hasn't been served, but since the eviction notice, the Accra municipal authorities, they basically said, like, formally, we are not giving any public services to this area. Okay? So there is like a, a, a trickle of services, uh, you know, MPs, they have some discretionary uh, uh, budgets. Uh, people, they manage to scrounge uh, a lorry load of electricity poles and all the rest of it. But like, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, law-wise, the place isn't entitled to anything. And of course, from the government's perspective, they can't get rid of them. And, uh, and they can't allow them to stay. So this is the this is the stalemate going on. Um, economically, it's extremely vibrant. You know, like in any such home in Africa city, there's tens of thousands of, walker, of hawkers and uh, scrap dealers and eateries, eateries, eateries and marketeers and seamstresses and mechanics and headquarters and all the rest of it. A lot of them they find their they scrape a living there, and a lot of them are quite successful. You know, accommodation in a place like this. It's, it's really nothing compared to other areas of the city. Uh, so economically it's vibrant, but politically it's in limbo. Um, the, the, the status at the moment is like the eviction notice has been taken off the table. There's, there's talk of a partial move. Uh, shall, we, uh, shall, we, shall we move a part of them? Shall we, shall we try and move the people that live close to the most frontline <coughs> areas? Shall we, shall we try and partially upgrade it? Uh, there's also all sorts of NGOs who have tried to provide like micro loans for people to uh, establish uh, concrete houses. So economically vibrant, politically limbo, and legally it's doomed. That's the situation. Uh, government doesn't want or it can't develop a formal uh, or systematic relations with the area, but it can't ignore the people or the local institutions that are taking shape in there because they're, they're becoming politically. Um, uh, slide please. This is a side view of the area. Um, um, the government have tried, in, 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 in uh, let us say, an agreement with the uh, local institutions that are forming there, they've tried to reach an agreement that, say, that says keep the level of housing to one story. Okay? And this worked for, this has worked for uh, the first 20 years. The settlement is about 30 years old, but now, simply because of the density of it, the only way to go is up. And now there's, there's uh, two, three, four-storey houses springing up, simply because of the pressure on the ground. Uh, and you can see that, uh, I don't know if you see it, but it's very, you know, people are reclaiming these areas very close to the lagoon, uh, and, um, and the more they, they go into the lagoon, they say that the more that the chance of flooding uh, increases. Uh, I got interested in the place by, um, well, I've been interested in the place for years, but one of the things that made me, uh, that influenced the conceptual and analytical framework was this. It's a toll bridge across, like, a, let's say, a trash strewn uh, gully. There are three or four such bridges. Um, 
it's a real cash cow for the people who build these things, okay? Um, the city authorities, they can't or don't do anything to stop it. It's totally illegal, but highly visible. Uh, it's thoroughly locally legitimate, okay? Uh, every day you've got like thousands of people going across these bridges to homesteads, to marketplaces, uh, to and fro to the scrap things, collecting things, taking them back into the city. And, uh, and these guys who are, uh, you know, like basically uh, day laborers collecting money for a big man who's, been, who's managed to build such, a, build such a bridge. So this is clearly like, it's a very vital part of local infrastructure, okay? But it's neither planned or constructed or operated or licensed by government. Um, like much else physical and social infrastructure in North Alabama, like the water supply, the sanitation, the building regulations, the schooling, questions of law and order, they're operated and regulated by institutions that are out, 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 of, out of government uh, influence. Um, so like kind of like fishing around and uh, looking into uh, who is controlling these things, um, there's an organization, uh, slide please. Uh, this is called uh, OFADA, the Old Fadama Development Association. And this is their head office, and this is the gentleman standing in front of his goats as the chairman. Um, there's basically 19 different ethnic groups uh, living in that area, and uh, OFADA allows each ethnic group um, one member to sit on the OFADA council. Okay? Uh, because the ethnic groups are of different sizes, uh, they're not elected. Okay? There's, some, there's some ethnic groups that are a lot larger than others. But it's a way to try and say, look, there are different ethnic groups here. Each ethnic group has a member. Um, and like uh, we're going to put a membership together and then we're going to try and develop the place. Okay? So it's got 16 members and, uh, and an executive council. Um, the people who, are, who become members, uh, generally they, uh, they call themselves chiefs or sub-chiefs that may or may not be related to let's say, the institutions of chieftaincy further north. Okay? Um, they, um, they, they, uh, you've got garbage management, the clearing of fire breaks, uh, next, next slide please. These are some of the things they do. They make sure that the building be between houses is uh, spaced correctly. Uh, here, at the top right, you can see where, you can see where they scrounge through electricity poles, uh, where there's building going on. They, uh, they say to people, hey, try and make sure that you build in concrete instead of wood to lessen the risk of fire. And here you can see they've constructed the trees uh, going onto the lagoon. And here they've also constructed, like, um, they've, they've made a, 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 a they cleared the way between the first row of housing and the lagoon to stop to lessen the risk of, uh, the risk of flooding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can also see they actually they um, they uh, they rally around to collect contributions for the building of mosques. There are mosques everywhere in this place, and in truth, because there is a very strong religious symbol, uh, they've got an idea that okay, the more mosques, it's, it's more difficult for the government to destroy a mosque than it is for to destroy the illegal house. So that's why they build mosques everywhere. Uh, here you can see where there's a fire that's destroyed houses. They go around and they would try and make sure that the new houses that are constructed are in line with the, uh, with the old ones and everything is done fairly. Um, so the conclusion from all this, um, three broad conclusions pertaining to the conceptual thing. I mean, if we read the, a lot of political science for this, it's, it, it's a bit of an easy point to score. But what is going on in this place, it tells us that, um, that so the organisations of governance is not the same as government, okay? Uh, this, a lot of the literature we read, it, 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 it makes an automatic um, uh, one and the same between government and state. This is, a, this, is an, this is an example where like state practices like justice and uh, uh, infrastructure, things that are normally done by the state, these are actually done by non institute statutory institutions. The second thing is like we, we, we are led to believe that public authority is shaped by uh, the implementation of formal state law. Here is an example where it's not, it's shaped through social processes. It's shaped through people's negotiations, it's shaped through claims and counterclaims and what local people are led to believe. This is what makes people invest in, in local public authorities. 
The third aspect is like, uh, for me, this isn't an element of a, it's not an example of a weak state, but it's actually an example of a strong state. It's because the government's very, very strong legalistic approach to the area, uh, which means that they're absent from it, and um, that basically keeps the stalemate going, okay? Um, that's, that's, um, it was a bit fast, a bit rushed, but that's what I had. Okay, thank you.